Shalom everyone, and thank you for joining me in the study of Parashat Vayetze. In this parasha, the Torah describes Yaakov's fleeing away from Eretz Israel, from the land of Israel, basically running for his life. Esav, his brother, who discovered the deception, uh, wanted to kill Yaakov, and he says, I'm just going to wait for my father to pass away, for Yitzhak to die, and then I'm going to kill my brother Yaakov. Rivka knows about it, she says to Yitzchak, and then they send Yaakov to Rivka's family. And also, it's not only that Yaakov is basically running away for his life, but there is also some kind of a mission. He needs to get married and build a family. And then later on, says Rivka, I'll bring you back here. But what I would like to focus on today is Yaakov's experience at the place he went to sleep. And what do I mean by that? So let's take a look at the narrative. And Yaakov left Be'er Sheva and he went to Haran. So it happened to be that he found himself in this place. So he slept there because it was already sundown. He took some of the stones and he put them underneath his head, and he slept at that place. And then he had a dream. So he saw a ladder that is based on the ground, and its head basically reaches the sky. And he saw ministering angels going up and down. And Hashem stands or basically stood upon or above Yaakov, Vayomar, and he says, Ani Hashem Eloke Avram Avicha Veloke Yitzchak, I am the God of your grandfather Avram and your father Yitzchak. Ha'aretz asher ata shukhev alea lecha et nena o lezarecha, the land that you basically sleep on, this is your land, this is your land, this is your descendant's land. Vayazar acha ke'afar ha'aretz, and your descendants will be like the dust or the sand of the earth, and you will be able to conquer and to expand your borders eastwards, westwards, northwards, southwards. And every family of the earth will be blessed by you, which is very similar to what Hashem told Avraham, that we saw in Parashat Lech Lecha. I'm going to be with you. I know that all my promises to you now seems like totally not true. You are running away from the country, you are running away from the land, but I promise you, I'll protect you. I'm with you and I'll protect you everywhere you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will never leave you alone. So I will not leave you, I will not abandon you until I will fulfill my promises to you. Now, this is a wonderful dream. Basically, Hashem promised Yaakov and guaranteed his safe passage and his safe return. He didn't tell him when, but Yaakov has a promise from God that God will be with him, protect him, and bring him back. And Yaakov woke up from his sleep, and he says, Achen, yesh Hashem b'makom hazeh v'anokhi lo yadati. Achen, it would be very hard to translate into English. It's like, almost like, aha, or, wow, now I realize, now I know, now I recognize, now I can see that there is God is in this place and I did not know. Vayirav ayomar, and then he became terrified and he said, manura makom hazeh, this place is awesome, or terrifying, this is probably the house of God, and this is the gate to heaven. Now, Yaakov's reaction to the dream and to his realization that God spoke to him at that place is somewhat surprising. When he says, Oh, wow, I didn't know that Hashem can be in this place. What does it mean? But Yaakov couldn't fathom the idea that God is everywhere. And also, if he would know, let's say if Yaakov would know that Hashem is in this place, so what, he would not sleep there? 
what exactly Yaakov's reaction comes to teach us? And what can we learn about, uh, let's call it, spiritual awakening? So let's see what the commentators have to say about it. So the Midrash, Lekach Tov, which is a little bit of a late Midrash, says the following. Achen yesh Hashem b'makom hazeh? There is really a God in this place? Achen ha-shechina shruya b'makom zeh. The divine presence dwell in this place. Melamed, it's come to teach you. Sheha-shechina b'veit ha-mikdash, that the divine presence dwells in the temple. Ben banui, no matter if the, tem the temple is built or destroyed, the divine presence is always there. So what does that have anything to do with Yaakov's dream? So according to our sages, Yaakov's dream was at the Temple Mount. Exactly the same place that the Akeda, the binding of Isaac, took place. And now Yaakov is sleeping in the Temple Mount. There is no, there is no temple. There is no Beit Mikdash yet. There is nothing. There is a mountain. And at that mountain, Yitzchak was almost sacrificed. According to other Midrashim, this is also the place where God basically established or basically built the universe from. But there is nothing on that mountain. What Yaakov realized, according to this Midrash, is that in a very mundane place, or even a place that the Beta Mikdash was destroyed, the Divine Presence never ever leave Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, or the land of Israel. The connection of the Kedusha that was already the sanctity, the holiness, that was already established and God's divine presence, they are already glued together. The building, the temple, is a wonderful reflection of it. But even when the temple is not there, God is always there. We think about it today as, okay, this is not a noble idea. But when you think about it, and especially when you compare it to ancient times, any society or group that believed in idol worshipping, the minute that the temple of that idol was destroyed, that, that idol lost its strength and ability because if he couldn't protect his house, he's gone. With Hashem, the building, the temple, the, the structure was never something that defined God. God does not need a temple. It was our initiative. It was our initiation that we want to build a Beit Mikdash that was David Amelech, King David. But God is everywhere. And that's what Yaakov realized and, and understood that moment. God has a connection with human beings, not necessarily through buildings. But there is a direct connection, direct relationship between human beings and their Creator. So that's what it means, Achen yesh Hashem b'makom hazeh. That looks like it's just a regular place. There is no holy site, there is no holy temple, there is no holy building, just me, the ground, and some stones. And still I can find God in the most natural place, most regular place, most normative place. What seems to be so, so superficially as a nothingness, you can find God everywhere. This is, obviously, the root precept of the understanding and the idea, the Jewish idea, that God, you can find God everywhere you look for Him. You can look at a, at a stone, you can look at a rock, you can look at a tree, you can look at another human. God is everywhere. In Bereshit Rabbah, he continues that path and says, and Yaakov says, yes, true, there is God in this place. The divine presence dwell in this place. And I would not know. Again, Yaakov says, I, I, I couldn't even fathom the idea that God would be here. 
and he will reveal myself, himself to me. This is just a regular place. This is the idea. Even in the most regular place, most mundane place, you can find God. The Rashbam says the following. אכן יש השם במקום הזה, לא כמו שהייתי סבור כששכבתי כאן שהוא מקום חול. Unlike what I thought before that I can sleep here because this is just a, a mundane place, this is a not an, a holy place, it's an unholy place. אך כן הוא, שהוא מקום מקודש, ואכן כל אכן שבמקרא, אך כן, ולא כמו שהייתי סבור, אכן נודע הדבר. The Rashbam says the word אכן, א', כ', נ', is אך, can, which means it's not look what I thought before. Now, I want to dig deeper into the idea that I said before. It's not only that Judaism believe that God can reveal himself to us and have connections with us not only through a building, but we also believe, as the Zohar, the mystical book, would say later, let atar panui mine which means late, there is none, atar, a place that is empty from him, from God, which means God fills up every centimeter, every millimeter, every inch from every space. So there are some spaces that you can definitely quote unquote see God, temple, a shul, a synagogue, or something that it's out of the ordinary. But we believe that God can be found everywhere and He is there. The fact that you don't see Him, it's not because He is not there, it's because you did not uh, work on yourself enough to be sensitive enough or to be spiritual enough to see God everywhere you go. There is a fascinating statement by the Kotzke Rebbe who says, when he was young, he was asked, where is God? And his answer, which is filled with wisdom, says, everywhere you let him in. God is everywhere. And there is no mekom hol. There is no place for the mundane. Even the mundane is holy. And that's what Yaakov understood. And why was that so important? Because now Yaakov is going to go into exile. He's going to be with people who are totally unlike him. That's Rivka's family, Lavan, who was a prime criminal. Okay, he was a deceiver. He deceived Yaakov so many times. He didn't know how to handle things. He changed things. He changed his world. He spoke to people who are not talking the same language, the same conversation with him. And you would think that this is a place which is basically godless, a godless place. God is not involved, you can't see God there. And Yaakov now realized, even when I go to exile, even when I go to a very unholy place, my mission is to find God even there. And by the way, before Yaakov comes back to Eretz Israel, comes back to the land of Israel, he has a prophetic vision. God speaks to him because you can see God even outside of the land of Israel. Even when you are a shepherd, even when you walk day and night and you don't have time to learn or to immerse yourself in spirituality, you can find God if you want. So this is one of the most, I think, insightful lessons that the Rashbam is teaching us. Yaakov says, There is nothing holy here. I'm just going to sleep here. And now I realize that there in everything I do, everywhere I go, there is no such a thing as an un unholy place. There is holiness everywhere. You just need to open your eyes and see. Rashi says, lo yadati, she'im yadati, because if I would have known, lo yashanti bemakom Kadosh kaze. Yaakov basically realized something that, in a way, it's very humbling. He says, I did not know 
that this place is so holy. I knew every place is holy. Unlike what we saw before with the Rashbam. Meaning Yaakov recognized that this place has something special. But I didn't know it's so holy. If I would have known, I would not sleep there. Why? What does that mean? I would not sleep there, but I would sleep somewhere else? Or I would just not be able to sleep because I would be so excited and will anticipate some kind of a prophetic vision. It might be that these two options can affect the understanding in Rashi. If we say that Yaakov says, if I would have known that this is such a holy place, I would never be able to sleep because I will be so anxious to see some kind of a prophetic vision. So that will explain that Yaakov in a way miscalculated the holiness of this place. Or alternatively, Yaakov is teaching us that there are certain really holy places that you shouldn't sleep there. Because sleeping there, in a way, it's not a disgrace to the holiness of the place, but it just, it doesn't fit. It doesn't match the holiness of the place. You shouldn't. So in a way, whatever explanation we will choose, Yaakov shows regret, some kind of a regret of not really understanding the holiness of the place. So that's according to Rashi. Rabovadia Svono explained this idea in a different way. And he says, Achen yesh Hashem b'makom hazeh. Truly, or oh, now I recognize that there is God in this place. Ein safek, no doubt, sheze ha-makom muchan le-nevu'ah. Yaakov says, there is no doubt in my mind now that this place is ready for prophecy. Me'achar sh'ra'iti bo mar'e kazot, how do I know that this place is, uh, is ready to receive prophecy? Because I was not ready to receive any prophecy. I slept here. And I saw visions like that. I saw the dream with the ladder and the angels coming back and forth. And God spoke to me. And that was without me being ready... I didn't prepare myself for prophecy and I still received it. So obviously this place has some kind of, of uh, holiness or, or readiness to create this link between the Creator and the human being. This is a beautiful interpretation. The Svono says, sometimes when we speak about being ready for prophecy, so we know that in order to be a prophet, you need to try to separate your physical being and your cognitive spiritual being. For example, we know that one of the things that helps you doing it is music. King Saul, according to the story in Tanakh, he was able to, to have some kind of prophecy by what? By listening to music and to be able to transform himself from the physical world into what we will call, let's say, the spiritual world. But also, I think we can all share the same notion that when we land here in Ben Gurion, there is a different feel. When we walk in the streets of Jerusalem, when we go to the Kotel, when we go to the cave in the Machpelah in Hebron, there is a different feel. When you, sta when you stand on the Har HaZetim, on the Olive Mountain, and you see the Temple Mount, and you see Jerusalem, and you see the land of Israel. There is a different feel. There is a feel of, of Kedushah, of holiness, of sanctity. 
says this phone. Yaakov realized that a space, that a place, even though this mountain looks exactly like this mountain, but because this mountain had something special, unique, it transformed the mountain, not in the DNA of the mountain, the environment, the atmosphere of the mountain, that adds to your spiritual world. And our sage says it, Avira shel Eretz Israel machkim. Literally, the air in Eretz Israel, in the land of Israel, make you wiser, make you enriched in your understanding. This is not mystical. This is really a feeling that I think we all can share or identify with. And that's what Yaakov realized. And then Yaakov says, Ve'anuchi lo yadati. Sheilu yadati, if I would know, na'iti machin atzmi nevoah ve'lo kenasiti. Sforno basically says that Yaakov had regrets that he was able, if he would know that this place is ready for prophecy, so Yaakov would say, look, A, I have the place, I have the space which is ready. And now if I will make myself ready, I would be able to what? To grasp even more in terms of the prophecy that was revealed to me. Meaning Yaakov has regrets that what? That yes, I received the prophecy and it's wonderful. It's amazing. God will protect me, will bring me back. I will build my family. Everything is wonderful. However, I could have achieved more in terms of spiritual understanding in what will be the destiny of the Jewish people if I would prepare myself. And in a way, I think there is tremendous lesson here, especially for people who live in Israel, but also for the people who come and visit Israel. When we live here, or when you come and visit, you know that it's already, there is an already built-in spirituality in the land of Israel. Rabbi Yudha Alevi, in his famous book that is attributed to him, the Kuzari, talks about the land of Israel as Mekom Shechina, a place of the divine presence. When you walk the streets of Jerusalem, when you walk in Judah and Samaria, when you walk in Hebron, you walk in the footsteps of our forefathers, of our prophets. When you go to the Carmel Mountain, you can hear Elijah confronting the false prophets. When you walk in the streets of Jerusalem, you can hear Jeremiah, Isaiah. Basically, the Tanakh comes alive right here in Israel. Israel as a, as a place, as a country, as a land, it's already injected with spirituality, with holiness. And therefore, it's up to us to get ready and to make ourselves even readier, more ready, to receive these spiritual messages and lessons. That's what the Sforno says. That was, was Yaakov's regret. He says, I already slept here on this holy land, which is ready and made, made me able to receive prophecy. But now, ah, I, I missed an opportunity. I really missed an opportunity to gain even more insight, a prophetic insight into Jewish destiny. So we, as his descendants, we shouldn't repeat the same mistake. We already know that there is sanctity right here in this land, in every piece of the land. Every brick of every wall. It's not only history, it's sanctity. And therefore, it demands of us to get ready as well. And to be able to receive this light of spirituality of divine presence into our lives. The Nativ suggested, Yaakov says, Oh, there is God in this place and I did not know. So the Nativ chose really our first option, based on Rashi, that we said what? 
that Yaakov did not only have regrets, he was sad, he was upset with himself that he slept in that place. Why? This is incredible. The Nazif says, Yaakov felt so bad about what he did. He says, I slept here in a place that I could have received a direct communication with God. Such a missed opportunity. At the time that I was sleeping, I, would, I, would, I was able to daven, to pray, to request things from God while I'm still awake and not just in a dream. You know, when you have a dream, some things, sometimes you can also have hesitations. Did I really see it or I was just really dreaming about the dream? It's, I'm not sure. Yaakov, in a way, feels that he missed an opportunity to cement his relationship with God. If I would known, I would not act like that. To sleep in a place that you can really talk to Hashem directly? It's like, you know, lehavdil, what we say, meaning like, uh, it's like a parable. You go to meet with someone that you really need and you are in his palace and they're bringing you into his room and you fall asleep on the couch. And you remember that he said something. You will be upset with yourself. And you will say, why did I fall asleep? I should have be stronger, be awake, and talk to the king. That's what Yaakov felt. I think the lesson for it, for us, is we are in a place which is so holy. I'm not saying we shouldn't sleep. Obviously, it's part of our physical needs. But don't be asleep. Don't walk while you are sleeping. Don't put yourself into such a situation that you are not aware and awake to receive those spiritual enrichments that we have here. Yaakov, now, after the fact, realized if I would have known, I would not act like that. Rabbi Shimshon Rafael Hirsch explained Yaakov's reaction in the following way. So Rabbi Shimshon Rafael Hirsch has a totally different take and he says when Yaakov says, oh, now I realize that the divine presence dwells in this place, he basically showed humility. Yaakov was so humble and he didn't want to connect the revelation to him, even though he was the reason for the revelation, but rather he put it on the, pl on the place, on the land that he slept on. Achen, ein tzorech levakeshet Hashem b'shamayim. This is a very, I will call it, a realistic interpretation. Rabbi Shimshon Lefad here says, you don't need to find God in heaven. The first thought that Yaakov has is, everywhere you put your head on, everywhere you put your hands on, Everywhere you walk, if you are not guilty of any transgressions or sins, if you know who you are, you will find God everywhere you go. You don't need to go to heaven to find God. You can find Him in your life. Ve'az humosif. And now he adds another component to it, which is, ve'anuchilo yadati. And I did not know what you didn't know. לא ידעתי שכבוד השם שוכן בעולם הזה ביחד עם האדם. I didn't know that the divine presence dwells here with us, with human beings. This is an interesting take because the focus of Rabbi Shimshon Lefael Hirsch on, in, in his explanation about Yaakov's reaction is 
that the idea that God dwells only in heaven or only in spiritual places or holy places, this is definitely not Judaism. We believe that it's also on earth. But the chidush, the, the, the new thing that Yaakov was able to, to grasp is what? Is that God loves, love being with us. I didn't know that Hashem likes being here with us. Hashem wants to be with us. His providence, His hashgacha pratit on us, it's not just to be an inspector and a, a policeman, but rather He wants to see how His creatures, how the people He created, walk in His path and becoming compassionate, kind, good, valued people. That was the new understanding that Yaakov internalized at that moment. I know that God is everywhere. I know that God filled the earth with His divine presence. But I didn't know that God is really interested in having relationships, so to speak, with me, with the individual, with the person. And this is the revelation, according to Rabbi Shimshon Rafael Hirsch. Rabbi David, David Zvi Hoffman, also from Germany, in the 19th century, go to the 20th, says, Yesh Hashem. What does it mean? There is God. So, at the beginning, says Yaakov, I thought that only in a place that you create an altar or you have some kind of a service, only there Hashem comes, reveals Himself to you and helps you. Which means, not that God has no interest in the world, but... God would wait until you initiate the conversation, so to speak. You build an altar, you bring a sacrifice, you do something of a spiritual service, and then God says to you, oh, I'm here. Ataraiti. Now I see. Shegam bamakom Hashem. Now I realize that you don't even need to initiate any quote-unquote holy service. Hashem dwells with you, even if you don't do anything spiritual or holy. Basically, Yaakov, after the experience of the dream, understands that God is with you, even if you are not exactly involved directly with something holy. And why is it? Because everything that you do, if you do for the right purpose, it becomes holy. There is no separation between, okay, this is holy, there is God, this is not holy or unholy, and God does not exist there. No. This is holy and God exists here. And that might be unholy by our definitions, but God is there. He does not need you to always be holy. Meaning, he wants you to be holy, but also holy while being involved in things that seems to be unholy. Zeu Beit Elokim, makom shebo yoshvim alachav alei adamot. The angels, the ministering angels, sit right here on earth. Ze harishon musav anekudat motzao shel asulam. Zu she asulam omed baal aretz, kan ze Beit Elokim. As we know, the ladder that, uh, that Yaakov saw in the dream had is base on the earth and the top in heaven. He says, this is the base, this is Beit Elohim, this is the house of God. This is unbelievable. Rabbi David Tzvi Hoffman says, Yaakov realized that really everything holy starts where? Here, on earth. Zebet Elokim. This is one, the earth, where the base of that ladder is. This is the base of the house of God. Vezeh Shara Shamayim, and where the ladder reaches, the heavens, 
This is the gate for heavens. But where everything begins? With Beit Elohim, with the house of God here on earth. I think Rabbi David Svi Hoffman brings it literally as a home run. We see here the formulation, in a way, of what is our religion all about. A, there is no separation between holy and unholy. Even things that seem to be unholy can become holy if you are involved with them, if you immerse in them and you elevate them. God's providence is everywhere. Even when you leave the temple or when there is no temple, when you leave the shul or the study hall, God continues to be with you. You can't just be compassionate, kind, generous, and have tremendous values only when you daven or when you are quote-unquote emerge, Im immerse, sorry, in your spiritual holy life. God demands of us to have Beit Elohim, to have the house of God everywhere we go, even when we are immersed in the most mundane, unholy acts. This is what Judaism is all about, is to be a farmer and to be dedicated to God. It's to be a doctor and to be dedicated to God. It's to be a rabbi and to be dedicated to God and to be a builder and to be dedicated to God. Everything we do, everything we are involved with has divine presence there. We just need to see it and we need to expose it. We need to reveal it to us and to others. So, today we spoke about spiritual awakening. Spiritual awakening is not only for those special moments that you have this spiritual awakening of, wow, now I can see God. Like if there is a miracle or an incredible experience. It's the day-to-day -day life. It's the waking up in the morning and going to work and do the same thing you did yesterday and maybe something a little different. And to find God in the mundane details. To know that Beit Elohim that the house of God is right down here on earth. It's not in heaven. And to know that, to really fully internalize it, not only putting some kind of responsibility on our shoulders, but I think gives meaning to what we do. There is no separation between holiness and unholiness. There is integration between them elevating the mundane to the holy and bringing the holy into the mundane and create a life, a life of Kedusha, of spiritual awakening and mindfulness, a true life of sanctity and holy. Thank you.